Please stand and join me for our opening hymn, number two, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. join me in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the glories of nature that you have given us, for the sunshine, the newness of spring, the growth of summer, the harvest of fall, and the rest of winter. We are in the time of rejuvenating in our seasons. So during this spring season, may we also grow in faith and blossom forth to carry your love out into the world. Let us join together as we say the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning. We have one addition to our prayer concerns this morning, and that is Dana Tate. Please remember her in your prayers as uh, she has been uh, working through uh, some uh, health concerns, and she is now um, undergoing therapy. Please note the other uh, concerns that are listed in the bulletin insert. And we place these before Christ at his table. And now may the singing of our prayer hymn prepare our hearts for our prayer. Let us pray. God of the morning, wake us up to a sense of wonder today in awe of the very essence of our being connected one to another in the complex web of creation. Open our eyes to your presence as the glowing embers of sunrise leave streaks of cloud across the morning sky. And rooted in a meditation and worship in the deep breath of prayer, we ask that you make us brave in the face of every vulnerability and fear. Protect and enfold us in the face of uncertainty, even danger. In pain and worry and fear and grief, hear our prayer with sighs too deep for words. And pour out your spirit upon the whole earth, upon places of sickness and health, joy and sorrow, riches and poverty, war and peace. And we feel the polarity, the dichotomy, the disjunction of our relative safety in a war-torn world. We ask that you be with those suffering in Ukraine with all those who fight an unwanted, unwelcome, harrowing war. You know the faces, you know the names, you know the worries. Oh God, please be with them. 
and let some semblance of peace grow between us here, even now, so that some peace of our hearts might melt toward those who slander and offend us, who denigrate and dishonor us. There are so many, dear Lord, for brother, sister, parent, child, friend, and neighbor. And we lift up our hearts to you in the safe silence of this sanctuary. Hear our prayers, O God. give you thanks for hearing our prayers for you are our rock and you are our redeemer and we love you O God this is our prayer in Christ's holy name amen As we come to this time of stewardship, I came across this little saying, and that I, it touched my heart, so I decided to share it with you today. Christian stewardship begins with God at the center. When stewardship revolves around any other center, it is misconceived. The institution of the church is an inadequate substitute for the incarnate body of Christ. The church as an institution is a means to the end of the church as the fellowship of all believers. Stewardship is servanthood to God through the church, not to the church institution.
We humbly br bring to you, O oh Father, these offerings of all the blessings that you have given us. So many come in the form that was not cannot be brought down to the aisle, but by our sharing of our time and our talents, we ask that you will give your blessing upon the financial as well as the talents and time that we bring to you and guide us on the best use for them to share your love with the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Times like these, you need a Savior. In times like these, you need a Savior. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. This rock is Jesus, yes, he's the This morning's gospel lesson is found in John, chapter 21, verses 1 and following. And after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. 
and he showed himself in this way. Gathered were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, Well, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught not one thing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in, because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put out, put on some clothes, for he was naked, jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came into the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of fish, a hundred and fifty-three of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This is now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Then Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go to wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. The Lord said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. And after this, he said to him, follow me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, I've read this passage a lot of times. And one thing that I didn't see before, but I recently discovered, was the description of Simon Peter's physical strength. You know, the more I think about that, if there was anybody in this room that would remind me of Simon Peter, it would be old Devin. Devin, I heard a story about you and Barry. Barry, is it okay if I tell this story? It's true. It's true. Is it okay if I tell it, though? Why? <laughs> well, Barry said it was okay. <laughs> I heard a story when they were in high school, um, and I can't remember all of the details, but the one thing that will always stay in my mind was Barry challenged Devin that he couldn't get the change out of his pockets or whatever, and Devin proceeded to pick up Barry by his ankles 
tossed them upside down and was shaking them like this until the coins come up. And I didn't believe him, but Barry <laughs> says it's true. It has to be true. Devin, he's our Simon Peter. You see, when Peter realized it was Jesus on the shore, <laughs> he dove in and swam as fast as he could. So that leaves six disciples back in the boat. And the catch of fish was so big that those six men couldn't haul it into the boat. So what they did instead is they just drug it alongside of the boat as they took the boat to the shore and they tied it in the dock. But notice when Jesus says, bring me some fish, Simon Peter heads to the boat, grabs the entire net of fish, and drags it to the shore himself. Well, like our own Devon, Peter was not a man to be messed with. Here he is, a strong body, but he's weak in his soul, Peter. Probably because of that charcoal fire that he saw on the beach. You see, there had been another encounter across, across a charcoal fire in Caiaphas's courtyard when Peter denied Jesus, not once, not twice, but three times. And now with the smell of charcoal all around him, Peter stands in his guilt and shame across a charcoal fire on the beach with Jesus. And there on the beach, Jesus had the breakfast ready, and it would be the last meal they would ever share together here on earth. But the disciples didn't know that yet. It could be called the last breakfast. The significance of this breakfast for Peter was probably the most moving moment in Peter's life in ministry because that breakfast of grilled fish and bread was laid out across a charcoal fire. You know, there is nothing better than lake trout fire being roasted. Uh, that's my favorite fish, lake trout. And for me, it's heavenly. But I don't think Peter had much of an appetite that morning. You know, this scene is a sacramental scene. You see, Jesus was accustomed to the appetite one would have after a long day's work. In fact, you know, he was a construction worker, and he was a construction worker from the time of his youth as he followed Joseph into Sephoris and probably built some of those great Roman structures that were in that capital city of Galilee. And he knew what it was like to be hungry after a long day's work. So he prepares for them bread and fish. But in the offer, Jesus also knew of the deeper hunger which Peter had. Hunger for truth. Hunger for the love of God. Hunger to know this truly was the risen Lord standing before them. So just as he offered himself to them, every day of his earthly ministry, just as he offered himself to them from the cross, and just as he had offered himself to them in the broken loaf of that final Passover meal, Jesus once again offers them himself the bread of life. You see, across that charcoal fire of breakfast, Jesus begins a life-changing conversation with Peter filled with questions and answers. Recalling their very first meeting, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? 
what was Jesus talking about? Do you love me more than these other men love me? Do you love me more than these men? Or it could be, do you love me more than these things? Your livelihood, your profession, your skills, your fishing, your fishing boat, your nets, the gear, and all the stuff that goes along with fishing. Which one was it? It probably was all of them. When Jesus said that all the disciples would desert him after his betrayal, do you remember what Peter said? I don't care what these other guys do. I won't desert you, no matter what happens, even if it means death. You know, in a sense, Peter had been claiming that his love for Jesus was greater than any of the other disciples. That he was better than them, but he did desert Jesus. But not only did he desert Jesus, he denied even, even knowing Jesus three times. Even to a servant girl in that courtyard. Humble. All Peter could say was, Lord, you know that I love you. As if to say, Lord, I can't say that anymore. Not after what I did, but I do love you in spite of my failure. You know, with compassion and love, mercy, grace, and forgiveness, Jesus looked at Peter across that charcoal fire with the smell of that denial still in the air, and he said to Peter, Feed my lambs. Jesus be, is, being, is being very clear about Peter's role of caring for the young flock of new Christians, the lambs. Peter was to feed and nurture them through his leadership and faith. And Peter was no longer simply the apprentice shepherd. Now, Jesus was entrusting his flock with him. Hmm. Jesus was passing the mantle, just as Elijah had done with Elisha. Feed my lambs. Be good. Be the good shepherd that I was. And here's the punch. Hmm. And you will be willing to lay down your life for the flock as I did. As if it weren't enough, Jesus asked Peter a second time. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Well, Peter must have been confused. He had just answered that question, and yet Jesus was asking him again. And Peter didn't even hesitate this time. He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus replied, well, tend my sheep. Just in case Peter didn't get it, he was a little hard-headed at times, Peter. His strength wasn't the only reason Jesus called him the rock. Tend my sheep. Be the shepherd to this brand new flock that is struggling right now. Be the shepherd I called you to be and know this. Tend my sheep. And then the third time, Jesus asked, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Oh, I could just imagine what was going through Peter's mind. I wondered if the smoke of the charcoal fire had just shifted in that scene. Or maybe it was the coals that shifted and sparked up as Peter heard that question that stung him to the very core. But whatever happened, I think Simon Peter was drawn back to that scene in Caiaphas' courtyard. And I think at that moment, it all became crystal clear for Peter. 
And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. I can't hide anything from you, Lord. I can't hold anything back from you, Lord. You know, I would take it all back and I'd do something different. I am so ashamed. And then when Peter looked across the charcoal fire and locked his eyes with Jesus for the third time, what he saw was different. It wasn't loving disappointment in the eyes of Jesus. What he saw instead was an invitation to come home from a far country. It was an invitation into forgiveness. And it was an invitation back into the position of leadership for which Jesus had trained Peter. Three acts of denial, three acts of redemption across a charcoal fire with love and compassion, filled with redemption and forgiveness, Jesus said again to Peter, feed my sheep. You see, Jesus offers reconciliation, forgiveness, and redemption, a brand new beginning. And in doing so, he empowered Peter to be the leader that Jesus needed him to be. You know, if Peter were here today, he would say the story of your life, no matter what you have done, has not been ruined, not by your sin or somebody else's sin. God's plan for your life is not buried under a pile of mistakes. God has a plan for your life, a good plan. A wise plan, a loving plan, a sovereign plan. And that plan, no matter what you have done, that plan is still in effect. You have not missed it. He is still working out that plan in your life right now. The question is, do you believe it? What we do know is this is an opportunity for you at this table, our charcoal fire on the beach with Jesus, to renew our commitment to seek God and to follow Christ, to seek and serve Christ with our whole hearts, free of our past, no longer weighed down by our shame and regrets, It's at this morning, as we celebrate Holy Communion, put yourself in Peter's place and claim that new beginning. Oh, we've all smelled the fire, that charcoal smoke of our own denial. We each have those moments in our lives which only Jesus can redeem and forgive. And he meets you at this table so that you might bring them to him today. Receive the bread Jesus has to offer and experience that new beginning that forgiveness brings for you. Let us commit ourselves once more to the Lordship of Jesus Christ as we stand and sing our hymn of dedication.
come to the table. Christ has prepared this feast for you. And he asks you, do you love him? Of course we do. And Jesus says, follow me and feed my sheep. May God bless you at this time. Let us pray. Good shepherd, like helpless sheep, we gather needing your guidance. We hunger, we thirst, we are afraid. Like Paul, blinded on the road to Damascus, we need someone to take us by the hand, to heal us, to, to receive us into your community of faith. We thank you for this table set before us, for this bread and cup. For in them we taste and experience the love safety and leadership of your fold as we eat this bread and drink this cup we are fed by the love of the one who is at once who was once the lamb of god and the great shepherd of the sheep jesus christ our lord amen And now let us remember, on the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took the loaf, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Take and eat.
And in the same manner, he took the cup also, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, my blood shed for the sins of the world. Take and drink. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this place we can gather around your table. For it's at this place we are renewed, we are brought together to be the body of Christ, to go back out into the world, to bless those who need blessings, and that we might fulfill our purpose Be with us. Amen. Next Sunday, two more of our young people are going to be baptized. And also, uh, we're going to have a baby dedication. And it's going to be an exciting day as little Jack is going to be dedicated. And uh, I invite you to please come back next Sunday on Mother's Day as these young people give their mothers the best gift anyone could give their mother. Brothers and sisters, let us leave this place and may we be faithful.